Thanks, Wendy, and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know that uh, Dr. Pardol has given you a nice introduction to the immune system. Have you already heard a lot about how the immune system uh, interacts with cancer cells? And you'll hear more in the afternoon about specific cancers. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background to this question about why is the immune therapy more effective in some cancers than others. So as an initial background, this is how we envision that the immune system might interact with cancers. Tumors would have these. Got the pointer here, OK. Tumors would have these proteins that get released, or pieces of proteins that get released that we call antigens that get picked up by these cells, which are antigen-presenting cells, or dendritic cells. And they express these pieces of proteins on a receptor on their surface that allows them to be recognized by immune cells or lymphocytes in the lymph node. And when an immune cell, together with this second signal, recognizes this protein on or peptide on the surface of this antigen-presenting cell, it starts to divide and become activated and hopefully then finds its way back to the tumor that has this same peptide on it and starts to make other proteins called cytokines, which activate the immune cells and things from its granules called granzyme and perforin, which can destroy the tumor cells. So that's our view of how it should work. And if it worked that way, we wouldn't have cancer that we'd know about it get defeated in two weeks the same way we defeat viral infections. And you'd never know that you had a tumor. And maybe people are getting tumors all the time, and they're being defeated by this approach. But we know that um, tumors do happen. And so um, there are many ways in which the tumors can potentially get around this. And they're studying this. There are two different sort of approaches that cancers take that help us, help inform us as to who might be the best candidates to treat with particular therapies. So some tumors don't have, either through um, not having these peptides or through um, not making these uh, various signals that we call chemokines that might attract cells, immune cells once they've been recognized to, uh, once they recognize these peptides uh, that the cancer has, or by creating through maybe fibroblast proliferation within the tumor a physical barrier to the immune cells from actually seeing the cancer cells are have essentially protect themselves. They're essentially not able to be recognized or killed by uh, activated immune cells. And some of those tumors, which may include tumors that may vary, that we would consider uh, unlikely to respond to immune therapy, um, maybe tumors such as pancreatic cancer or um, some types of breast cancer um, are well defended and may never respond. On the other hand, there are other sets of tumors that have all the right constituents to allow for this immune reaction to happen. They have these peptides. They have chemokines that are being made that attract the immune cells to the tumor. And um, the, uh, the immune tumor expresses the protein so that the immune cells could potentially kill it. And those tumors, if they're growing, have to come up with another way of defeating that immune response. And this is where the immune checkpoints or the breaks come in. And so identifying those tumors that have immune infiltrates um, 
and have various um, immune regulatory factors that are upregulated and who have these proteins on the surface that can be recognized by the immune system is what we're trying to do to identify the patients who would re best respond to immune therapy. So three factors. Things on the surface that are unique and can be recognized by the immune system. Things that attract immune cells into the tumor. And things that have adaptively shut off the function of those immune cells are the type of tumors that we think will respond to immune therapy. And that may represent a large subset of certain tumors, such as melanoma, but not all of them, or no subset of, of certain tumors. And trying to sort that out is the work of trying to address the question that I was asked to address. So I got into immune therapy by giving interleukin-2, and we saw 10 to 25% of patients respond to interleukin-2, and about 10% had durable responses. And what we probably think happens is these are patients who can do all of the um, steps of this particular um, uh, immune algorithm, and they can get immune cells into the tumor, but they have a defect in their immune regulation, meaning that they don't have good T regulatory cells or the brakes of their immune system don't work. And therefore, when they get a driver like interleukin-2, the immune cells expand more than the regulatory cells expand, and then their tumors go away. But that's only a subset of patients with a rare set of tumors. So we needed better, better approaches to this. One approach that um, was initially started by Steve Rosenberg and colleagues at the National Cancer Institute was to take these immune cells which were in the tumor, these CD8 lymphocytes, and to take them out of the tumor and grow them up outside of this immunosuppressive environment and then eliminate all these immunosuppressive factors by giving high doses of chemotherapy and then give the patient back a new immune system. And that, as uh, Dr. Topalian certainly was involved in these initial studies, could produce dramatic results in a subset of patients, patients who got complete responses, which represented as many as 20 or 30 percent of the total patient population had very durable responses. But this was a very complex approach. It involved um, technical uh, skills of taking these immune cells, identifying which were the right ones, expanding them, and giving patients toxic chemotherapy, uh, to get rid of all these um, breaks on the immune system and then giving these cells back together with interleukin-2 to keep them alive. And so there was wondering, could we activate these immune cells inside the tumor microenvironment? And that's where the uh, understanding all these co-inhibitory and co-stimulatory factors that were talked about by Dr. Pardal and Dr. Luke come into play. And it turns out the two master immunoinhibitory factors are CTLA-4 uh, and PD-1 on the surface of the lymphocytes binding to their um, uh, ligands or binding to proteins on the surface of uh, tumor cells or antigen-presenting cells. So having antibodies that block that, those particular interactions, we hoped, and it turns out is actually happening, is activating those immune cells that have been exhausted or have been inactivated by the immune microenvironment, restoring their activity and restoring the anti-tumor effects. So this is just uh, a cartoon of how this works. This is an immune cell that has managed to find its way into the tumor microenvironment on its surface it has PD-1 because it's activated. When it sees an antigen on the surface of the tumor cell, it makes interferon, which is one of those cytokines used to try to kill the tumor cell. When the interferon interacts with the tumor cell, the tumor cell puts on its surface PD-L1, which binds to PD-1 
and shuts off the immune function of that T cell. And giving an antibody that blocks that interaction can restore that function selectively within the tumor. And as I, I think has been discussed and you'll hear more about later, this is working in a lot of different tumors, not just melanoma and kidney cancer, which are the tumors that are responsive to interleukin-2, but tumors that we never even thought had enough immune cells in them that could actually be responsive to immune therapy, such as non-small cell lung cancer, bladder cancer, head and neck cancers, lymphomas, maybe other cancers. So how do we identify who those, which are those cancers and who are the patients with those cancers who are gonna do best with particular therapies? And how do we identify what are the features that might need to be overcome in those patients who are not responding to allow some of the patients, more of the patients to respond? So this is work that was done by Dr. Tapali and Dr. Pardol's group at Johns Hopkins, where in melanoma, they identified that this PD-L1 expression that shuts off the immune response wasn't just happening anywhere in the tumor, but it happened really close to where there were lymph lymphocytes in the tumor. So this was not a chance event. This was an event that was related to the lymphocytes trying to kill the tumor cells and clearly a defense mechanism. So that suggested that where the PDL1 was being expressed or in tumors where PDL1 is being expressed, that that might be a marker of tumors that might have the, be sensitive to the immune cells that were there. And the initial data, this looked great in the initial publication. Only the um, tumors that expressed PDL1 would respond to anti PD1 therapy. None of these 18 tumors that lacked PDL1 expression responded. So that suggested that that might be very good. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as good as more data came out. And this is a series of a lot of different studies with PD1, PDL1 antibodies, different tumors, different assays. One thing that was consistent, though, is that more tumors that were PDL1 positive, whatever assay is being used, responded than those that were PDL1 negative. But there were always, except in this initial study, some tumors that didn't express PDL1 that still responded. So we don't think we can use this as a marker to exclude patients from getting um, anti PD1. It may enrich for patients who are going to respond. And therefore, when we're doing clinical trials, we tend to, you know, and we're balancing between two arms of treatment, we tend to make sure they're balanced between. PDL1 expressing tumors and PDL1 non expressing tumors to make sure that we can interpret the result of the trial well. We can't exclude patients because of this. But maybe this is a way of identifying which types of tumors we should focus on treating. If there's a portion of the tumors that express PDL1, then maybe that's a, um, a population of patients that we should study with these therapies. And the initial data, this is also from Suzanne Tapalian suggested that the only tumors in that initial study that responded were those that expressed PDL1 in some of the patients and in colorectal cancer or prostate cancer, which didn't seem to respond. None of those patients had PDL1 expression. So theoretically, you could go do a survey of all the different tumors, if they were collected in the right way and processed in the right way, and you had a standard assay to identify those tumors that have PDL1 expression, and those would be the ones that potentially could be responsive to um, immune therapy. So here's data also from uh, Janice Taub and uh, Dr. Tapalian and Pardol's group at Johns Hopkins, which suggested that in melanoma, um, you needed to have lymphocytes in order to have PDL1 expression. And however, you could have lymphocytes and not have PDL1 expression. So um, TIL 
or lymphocytes within the tumor are necessary but not sufficient for PDL1 expression. So in melanoma, it looks like if you have PDL1, you're probably going to have lymphocytes there. But we don't know whether that's the case in other tumors because they could make PDL1 by other mechanisms. And so having PDL1 and lymphocytes there is what we really want. But there are also this group of tumors that have lymphocytes but no PDL1 expression. And we wonder, are these the potentially PDL1 negative tumors that respond to immune therapy? Is it because there's something else that's shutting off the immune response or the lymphocyte infiltrate is not powerful enough to um, actually activate PDL1 on the surface of those tumors? So um, there are two mechanisms by which PDL1 could be expressed. One is through a mutation in the tumor, and there are certain pathways that can be activated and express PDL1 on the surface of the tumor without having an immune infiltrate there. And this happens in some tumors, such as brain tumors, and we don't know to what extent other tumors. While the pathway that we've been talking about that is, sets a tumor up to be responsive to immune therapy is PDL1 expression through that's induced by lymphocytes getting into the tumor, what we call adaptive resistance. And trying to sort out in tumors that have PDL1 expression which factor is involved can help us decide maybe which tumors are best to treat. And maybe it's important to have not just PDL1, but the lymphocytes there. And maybe it's the important thing is to see the lymphocytes there, because that's the driver of the PDL1 expression in the immune responsive tumors. So, this is work done by Jim Ulay at the Moffitt Cancer Center, where they took a lot of tumors and they decided the way lymphocytes get there is by these various signals, which are called chemokines. And they studied a whole host, thousands of tumors, to see whether they could identify those that had uh, these chemokine signatures in them versus those that didn't. And they divided up fairly nicely for melanoma and other tumors into two groups. And the group that had the chemokine signature had a better prognosis, but they also had these small little lymph node structures which if the pathologist looked hard enough in the tumor microenvironment. And these are immune cells organizing themselves to try to defeat the tumor. And these can be missed unless you're really looking for them. And only with this chemokine signature could pathologists actually go back and do enough slices to say, oh, there they are. So maybe this is what's really important, this chemokine signature to set up these type of lymph nodes. And if you're missing aspects of this signature, you don't have these micro lymph node structures within the tumor. So what are the tumors that express these, this chemokine signature? Um, these are a listing of the various tumor types. You can see melanoma. 20% of tumors have, are in the 90th percentile of this particular signature expression. But a lot of other things that are here, including various head and neck cancers, bladder cancer, um, lung cancers, non-small cell lung cancers, um, cervical cancer are also expressed as signature to a high degree, and they overlap in a high degree with the type of tumors that are responsive to immune therapy. So, PDL1 expression, this type of chemokine signature are clues. But why are some of the tumors uh, with immune infiltrates not responsive to PD1 or PDL1 blockade? So, it it's possible that those tumors may express other inhibitory molecules. Um, and there's that whole list of immune checkpoints that could shut off the immune system. So it's possible for some tumors that what you need to block is not PD-1 interacting with PDL1, but other checkpoints such as LAG3 or TIM3. And therefore, we need research to sort that out for those other types of tumors. 
And fortunately, these other type of checkpoints, many of them are proteins that can be blocked by an antibody, so they're druggable. And some of these antibodies to these various targets are being developed and are entering clinical trials, and they may be the answer for tumors that have immune infiltrates but lack PDL1 expression for how we might want to treat them. So in putting that all together, this is a, a nice model that was um, created by um, Mario Schnall that how you might divide um, tumor cells into different categories based on PDL1 expression, which is B7H1, and TIL expression. So the PDL1 negative TIL negative tumors, this is a situation where we could call it immunologic ignorance, where the immune cell hasn't the immune system hasn't recognized anything there for one reason or another. Unlikely that those are going to respond. This is the adaptive resistance model that has PDL1 and TIL in them. These are the tumors that we think will respond to, to a higher degree to PD1, PDL1 blockade. These are tumors that have TIL in them but have, don't have PDL1 expression. They may respond to. Um, another checkpoint inhibitor, or you may need to stimulate um, the immune system a little bit more to induce the PDL1 expression. So that's where you might need combination therapy, such as giving uh, ipilimumab together with PD1 or some immune cell agonist. And then there's these tumors that have no immune cells and PDL1 expression, which is through an intrinsic mechanism. And we don't know what happens to those, but Without immune cells there, they're likely not to, going to be able to respond to immune therapy. So there are issues with PDL1 as a biomarker. It may be less relevant for combination therapies. So if you can uh, induce it with a drug such as ipilimumab or a cytokine, it may not be that important that it isn't there in the beginning. And because of this, um, the way to potentially identify combination partners to give with a, um, a PD-1 or PD-1, PD-L1 antibody is to give something that might induce that immune inflammation, that it might induce PD-L1 expression in a preclinical model or in early clinical studies. So we're looking for those to be agents that we might be able to combine with a checkpoint inhibitor. And finally, and you'll hear more about this later, what the immune system recognizes, we know more about those antigens, and these are not typically these, prote uh, these mutations that you might hear about that drive tumors, such as BRAF mutations or EGFR mutations in lung cancer or v VHL mutations in kidney cancer. These are usually passenger mutations that just happen to be there because of damage to the tumor by either the sun or by cigarette smoking or by problems that tumors have in dividing in a normal way. And those tend to be the lead to the antigens that are recognized by the immune system. And therefore, tumors that have more mutations may be more likely to have antigens that can be recognized by the immune system. And therefore, it's not surprising that many of these Tumors that respond to immune therapy, the lung cancers, the esophageal cancers, bladder cancers, are also the ones that are higher on the list in terms of various mutations. And just as data to suggest that this is the case, if you look at, uh, because mutations are caused by smoking, if you look at response to a PDL1 antibody in patients with lung cancer, it's more likely, you're more likely to respond if you were a smoker than if you had non-small cell lung cancer and never smoked. And that's probably not because the smoking makes your immune system healthier, but because there's something that your immune system can recognize in that setting. So in summary, tumors that respond to immune therapy are more likely to have T cell immune infiltrates, have adaptive expression of PDL1 on their surface, have more mutations that serve as novel antigens for immune recognition, and therefore are more likely to have resulted from exposure to various exogenous mutagens like cigarettes or sun. 
And then the question is, so we, these are our clues, and this is something we're all working on, is can these various factors be combined into some type of model to identify tumors and individual patients that should receive either single agent or combination PD-1-based blocking immunotherapy, and what type of combination should we use? Thank you very much. Thank you.